the CATS organization was originally founded or started in Bowie, but it's grown to include, well, not to include all communities. It's partnered with different organizations in different communities. And we provide a lot of different uh, types of support. It could be research, it could be information, um, you know, just uh, whatever we can do to support the communities that are fighting against the maglev train. So in a nutshell, that's what CATS is. All the other organizations are independent. They operate on their own. Um, we just all get together and work together as a region to uh, fight the train. And I don't want to nitpick the words, but I thought we were studiously avoiding the phrase umbrella that we were okay. liaising with all these different okay. communities. Okay, all right, that's my And group. that they, yeah. by that virtue, that, uh, de that were, were de facto on the steering group. Okay, but that, oh, okay. Uh, that was not an organization. I think we were transitioning from an organization that worked well in Bowie to a broader structure, which was, like, I'll let you all decide what it is, but I thought we were avoiding uh, anyone, any organization, the Homeowners Association, too, they had suddenly been subsumed under cats. No, they're, they're, they operate independently. independently. Right. A good example is uh, the Greenbelt Advocates for uh, Environmental and Social Justice. Right. They do a lot within the Greenbelt community uh, independent of any other organization. Right. But if when they hold a public information day for the community to attend, we show up and we have people who speak and uh, provide information to people who work together. Mm -hmm. so. And try to support each other. Right. We're right. various rallies or activities. Try to show them support each other. Because I think the feeling is that the, the and that my, my apologies for saying umbrella, but that's, that, that's kind of in my head, but umbrella makes them a little different to me. Um, the, um, the, uh, I, I like the concept that, yes, there are the proposed routes and all the people in the communities own the proposed routes. However, as you said, it's a regional thing. A lot of people, it's important that people understand that it doesn't just affect, okay, here's a train, here's whatever, and that's it. It affects the whole region. It affects all the county. It affects the, if costs go up, whatever, or taxes or anything else, it affects that end. A lot of people here are reminded of what I, I was talking with someone who was saying, oh, well, it's not going, it was, a, it was an official, I won't say who it was, he said, it's not going, you know, right through my, my town, so I'm not paying, you know, really it's like attention. And I said, well, um, he said, it's, and I said, well, it's going through the waterfront park, you know, and the, the areas they're talking about, waterfront park, et cetera. And he said, the waterfront park? I said, yes, we're talking about the poor towns going. And he said, well, I go there all the time. And that's exactly what it means to me. You go there all the time. You go to the waterfront park, you go to wherever, you go to other areas. And so yes, it does affect more, even if it doesn't mean that directly that train would run through, go underground, or do whatever in a certain place. It's affecting the region. And so that's what attracted me. I started the, the, um, uh, or, uh, the Bladensburg uh, uh, section because I, um, uh, I wanted to be part of like the source going, uh, getting, getting sources of information that I didn't have my hands on, that I know had been done by data expert people that I could tap into, but also because of uh, providing a page, you know, to be able to put the Bladensburg opposition letter, for example, from the town of Bladensburg, and to put the things that were important to, to Bladensburg, just as Woodlawn, etc., that you could put your own things up there, just as a a place to hold it, if you will, and a place to go to, and you could see, and I like the idea of the pages, is you could see, you could go to Stop This Train and say, oh, Bladensburg, oh, Lithicum, oh, these people are doing this, and this shows the people on the route. And the good thing, too, is to bring in, even if it's not going through Bowie, even if it's not going through Glen Arden, tapping into the people in those places who are aware of it, who are against it, as well too so when we need people for rallies and all bring them in so they all know come and support us we're on this the sense of being together and that's what i believe uh and that's what, what i'm fighting for but i kind of I, I operate independently as well 
So, I mean, and also many places do their own things. I do a lot of different things, and I'm just as the Greenbelt Advocates for Environmental and, uh, um, and Social Justice. I think that's right. I can't the title. I think Greenbelt Advocates. When, yeah. And at any rate, but that's what they do too. They are operating in a lot of different planes, so this is one part of what they do. So it's not. One, a, one of the things to look at is almost all of us came to this initially in NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard. When I, my first inkling, I just retired, and one of the reasons I retired is to actually take on projects around my property and my home or whatever that I've put off for a couple decades because I'm working all the time, okay? And then I hear something about SC Maglev. Well, what's this about? You know, th this is not the first time they talked about putting a Maglev train in. This is the third time, okay? And the past two times, it came very close to my home. We're talking within a half mile to a quarter mile of my home, both of the routes. So I got interested, and I found out that one of the original linemen's go went under my home. Mm -hmm. That got me very interested <laughs> in finding out a lot more about yeah. this. Um, that has since changed. They shifted it. They, the, when you look at the northern part of the run coming out of Baltimore through Anne Arundel County, it's pretty much one alignment. And then it splits as you get into the southern part of Anne Arundel County. But as we dug into this thing, we started finding out, wait a minute, uh, the, one of the first ones was the, the underground sections, every three to four miles you have to have a ventilation system. They have to put a structure on, on the surface. So one of the meetings we went to, I talked to Connie, the senior engineer for the, this, this system being designed. I said, well, how's this ventilation thing going to work? And she explained that if there's a fire in the tunnel, okay, that what they'll do is they'll take the upstream ventilation system and blow air into the tunnel and then we'll take the downstream one and exhaust. Okay, the concept is you try to flush the smoke out. Oh, that's interesting. So then we started thinking about, well, where are these things going to occur? Well, they're, they're going to be built every three to four months. So these are going to end up in virtually every community. So, okay, then you start thinking about, well, if there's a fire, what kind of fire is this going to be? Well, it's going to be an electrical fire. And I don't know how much you're all familiar with types of electrical fire. That means insulation on the wiring, which when it burns gives off, gives off cancerogens and toxins. So they're going to exhaust that in the community. Oh, by the way, we're going to tunnel somewhere between 80 feet and 150 feet underground through Anne Arundel County. You know, surface in Prince George's and then go back underground in Prince George's before you go into DC. Uh, not the, the, the northern part of Prince George's is still above ground. Yeah. yeah. So, as so we'll say, it'll be above ground, but it goes back in. Well, one of the interesting things about Anne Arundel County and Prince George's, if you are familiar with the topography and the land, is we have radon gas, which is radioactive gas, radioactive from naturally decaying radioactive materials in the ground. It's found throughout here. In fact, you may you, know, you may know someone that has an ex a, a ventilation system that's been put around their home to exhaust the radon gas. It's a known cancer. Okay, a little prolonged exposure. So we're going to be building a 42 meter, 20 mile long collection system for radon gas, and then periodically venting it out into their communities. Okay. Then you start looking at the communities, the structures. How big are they going to be? And they're going to have to have some kind of escape capability. You know, if there's fire, people got to get out. Well, how are you going to handle somebody? You, know, you start asking questions. Well, how do you handle somebody that's injured or ADA making an 80 to 150 foot climb? I'm not injured and I'm an ADA, but I'm not looking forward. To it. <laughs> and you start, you know, and you hold for that. that that's going to be interesting. That's right. How are you going to get fire equipment, et cetera, down in there? Okay. And you're going to need roads to maintain this, to get into this facility and maintain it, and to bring emergency equipment in if necessary. So all this is taking land. Okay, so even if it's going below ground, there's significant surface structures that are going to be built along all the underground sections. So that got me even more interested in going on, digging into this and getting involved. And then we started looking at things like, well, how are they going to pay for this thing? How are they going to generate the revenues to maintain and operate this? Okay. And we're looking at, okay, you have a, the MARC system, which we're all probably familiar with. Last year, they, they carried 
8,500,000 passengers. From Baltimore to D.C., I think the ticket is, what, $10, if you remember correctly. You know, and if you're over 62 or whatever, or 65 or whatever, you get a discount on that. If, if you're a student, you get a discount on that. So we started asking, well, what's your pricing structure going to be? Well, it's going to be similar, we think, right now to Amtrak. All right? You, and you think this is going to be a commuter used by commuters between Baltimore and D.C. Yeah, yeah. I so, you know, and so instead of paying ten dollars, and it's an hour ride, but ten dollars, you're going to pay fifty-five or more dollars up to, depending on, it could be up upwards of a hundred dollars for a round trip. Uh, that's you know, yeah, you save a half an hour, but it's like okay. So we started questioning the finance in this, and what it looks like. You know, when you talk to them, they said, well, we're not going after any, it's all going to be privately done, we're not going to go after federal funds. And then they turn around in a hearing and say, well, we're going after federal funds. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, where are those federal funds going to come from? Well, they would come most likely from transportation. You know, the transportation bins. Of, well, that's where the infrastructure money has to come from to redo roads, highways, bridges. We, I mean, the ratings of Maryland bridges, for example, is, you know, like, Poor, the deplorable, you know, uh, and we saw what just happened in Italy with one of their major bridges oh, collapsed, and how many people were killed on that. We've got the bridges that are getting into that zone. Okay, we have tunnels that have to be redone. We've got waterways that have to be redone. These are major transportation systems that are used by our commerce and by all of us. Okay, so the money's going to come out of that to go into this. Well, that's that's the most likely source of the money. So as you see, as you start kind of unraveling this thing, and you dig deeper and deeper and deeper into it, you start finding all kinds of questions about like, well, wait a minute, how's this thing going to operate? You know, how's it going to pay for itself? Where's the money going to come from? You know, who gives up the land? Okay, then they talked about, well, we would use eminent domain, which they have the authority to use because they got it under the licensing when they picked up the license for the Baltimore, Washington, and Annapolis Railroad. That was issued in 1932, I think it was, if I remember correctly. That railroad went defunct. Light rail out of Baltimore actually is using a piece of that rail right away. And but the license was just sitting there, and I won't say necessarily abandoned, but you know, sitting there idly. Well, they pick it up. Okay, they purchase it. Well, with that came federal right to do use eminent domain. Oh, then you, we started exploring eminent domain. You know, what does that mean? Well, they can come in and they can make you quote unquote a fair offer for your property to take your property and build this system. Well, then you get into the question about well, what's a fair value? So I will ask you, mm -hmm. what do you think a fair value for your property is, knowing anybody that's going to buy it, knowing that it's going to be destroyed? Do you mm -hmm. think that's going to help your property value? Mm -hmm. okay. So you start, again, you start questioning these, and you dig, 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 dig into this, and you start questioning. So while it all start, almost all of us started out with, I don't want this in my backyard disrupting my community. Mm -hmm. As we dug deeper and deeper in this, we started finding real environmental issues. We started finding major financial issues, safety issues, and, and many others. And then we started raising questions like noise pollution, vibration, etc. What is that going to do to our communities? And as Kevin's article pointed out, when the train went by, one of the gentlemen that he interviewed, his home, his masonry home, shook a bit. Okay. Well, I will share with you that, if you don't know much about construction, whatever, but masonry doesn't like to shake. It tends to break with enough vibration. So if you happen to have foundation walls, etc., which I think most homes do, you know, that have a basement, it's not probably going to be really good for it. Also, the tunneling that they're talking about goes through major aquifers that we know of. And there's sections of Anne Arundel County, at least in Anne Arundel County, we know that there are deep wells. That's that's where people are getting their water from. Mm -hmm. They could be. We don't know what that's going to do. If it will destroy them or disrupt them. Okay. 
again, as you dig more and more and more and deeper and deeper into this, you find that it's not only it's not in my backyard, there's a lot of other issues. And on the finance, it's going to hit everybody in Maryland. We're all, if this thing gets built, there's a good chance we're all going to pay for this thing, either through federal taxes or state taxes. And I'll tell you why I think state. They build this thing, and they go back to the federal government and say, well, you know, we really, we're, we're not generating the revenues we need. We really need help because we want to take this on to New York, but we need help to keep this thing running right now. The federal government's going to say, eh, it's going to be kind of in a sticky place to not want to help them. Okay. Especially if they get a five billion dollar loan from Japan, the Bank of Japan, who has already offered to make that kind of money available to them to build this. So now you get now we're getting into geopolitics. Now, do you think uh, I'll, I'll have by a show of hands? Who here thinks that the United States federal government would not bail out a five billion dollar loan linked to this company from Japan? when we have, we need them in our efforts to deal with North Korea and China. How many people here don't think that the federal government say, okay, where is that money coming from? Okay, again, most likely infrastructure. So, so we've gone from not my backyard to international politics and finance. You know, Pretty quickly, and it didn't take us long to figure this out. Okay, um, so even if these, let's say, they're saying they're not coming to state for funds, well then the question becomes if they're starting to run short of money, who's going to maintain these ventilation facilities, the roads, the substations, etc., that are going to be built? The state's going to have to come in. They're going to have to mow the lawn. They're going to have to repair the fencing. They're going to have to maintain some of the security perimeters. So we're going to end up being involved in this. Providing police and EMT. Exactly. Amtrak yeah. has its own police force. This morning. Yeah. So you get you get to that. Yeah. And then of that, when I talked about security, that was another issue. You have these elevated sections. You got a train supposedly going through 311 miles an hour across an elevated section. Beautiful target for a terrorist attack. You blow one of the staunchings, the track shifts or moves, this train's flying at 300 miles an hour. Anybody on it is now a grease spot wherever this thing stops. Okay? So you're going to have to put some kind of security perimeter around this. Well, who's going to maintain the security? So you start looking at all, you start having all these questions and it's like, yeah, we don't see this as a great idea at all. We see this as being extremely destructive. Disruptive in some cases, destructive in others. You know, and I think Bill had it worked out that all the elevated sections, basically a football field wide, long, wide swath, anything in its path is gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, to build this, just these elevated sections. Okay. I'm going to interject just and, a second. Bill, this gentleman speaking for his Bill Boom, if he didn't say our names. Bill Boom, like everybody should know, is right. I'm Susan McCutcheon, and I live in Bladensburg. And I'm Dan Wilber. I live in Anne Arundel County in Lithgow Heights. And the gentleman just seated. Dennis Brady. I'm from Bowie. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Jenny. Meet her up. I realized we had said he was. Sorry. So that it was a little bit big of a nutshell. Kind of gives you the scope <laughs> of why we're really concerned about this going forward, and that concern is growing as we do. We dig deeper and deeper and get more information. You know. What we're finding is not doesn't look good. You know. Then she will talk. Well, we were first of what we this was the kind of the background um, first of all of of the organizations uh, liaising together to uh, to um, um, in opposition, right. including the people directly on the proposed uh, of course people directly on the proposed route, but also why. Why others? Why, why example, Bill? Why you? Why are, are still and uh, in, in, um, are part of that? And Dan was saying, explaining all the issues. And so that's uh, yeah, Bill. Bill caught me before I came oh, Okay. And my apologies. Uh, that was not the problem with the clock. The call back spring ahead. Although it is a problem with the clock because when we had our meeting, we had a board meeting at seven and the regular meeting at seven thirty. So that's what I had in my mind. Oh. <laughs> my apologies for running late. Um, 
just to update a few things. Um, I haven't seen, I, I haven't de done a detailed inspection of the election results, but I believe everyone that supported us in, in Annapolis won re-election or one election. Um, so that uh, I think we're in pretty good shape. Uh, and I believe it'll carry over last year, uh, Senator Peters, my senator, uh, told me and told us to go through uh, Senator Pinsky. Mm -hmm. That he was oh, taking the lead, and that'll continue since he got reelected too. So mm -hmm. we're going to be gearing up for the legislative session. This year on our election, uh, it's a mixed bag. The good news is, is uh, Pam Bidel, who was delegate actively working with Valentino, Valentino Smith, Valentino Smith. Right. Uh, to try to get legislation in place to try to obstruct, challenge, slow down this process, was elected our senator. Right. Okay, so, and she's, being Democrat, she's going to get a probably a really nice position, I think, right. in or something. Uh, she told me, and I don't recall now. So, who are you talking about? Who? Senator Pam Biden. 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 District 32, was it? District 32. Up in? In Anne Arundel County. Lived okay. at Marion? Yeah, I lived in this community there. Well, Fort Meade area, right. uh, Lithicum, Jessup, uh, Harmons, et cetera. It's part of Liberty. The senator that she replaced, retired, Senator DeGrange, and he had led the challenge back in like 2004. Right, to stop the previous two. Right, so, so, so we, we had that. So and that's a good one. Continue. Carry on. Mark Chang, who was a delegate, who's at, uh, at both of these people live in Lithuania or have connections to right. the department. They're absolutely, he's adamantly opposed to this. Right. So he was reelected. The downside, though, is all four, or I'm sorry, all of the Republican candidates for delegate and for county council were adamantly opposed to this. They didn't win. One person who won for county council has already went to various communities and community meetings and told them, well, you're just going to have to figure out how to accommodate the building of this thing, because we need this infrastructure. Okay. Mm -hmm. this she won. This is the county council one of the ten gardens? Yep. It's to, uh, to educate her on that. Yeah, Sarah Lacey. And when you dig into her campaign finances, finances you find out that BWR made a nice campaign contribution to her. Not to say that, you know, <laughs> You know, because the head of Wayne Rogers, who's the head of DWRR, has been extremely active in the Democratic Party for years. He led the uh, Maryland half, Democratic Party. Half chairman of the okay. uh, Academy graduate and, from Baltimore originally played. Yeah, and so he obviously would normally support Democratic candidates, right. okay, but it seems interesting that she managed to get some, you know, she got 200 bucks. Not a lot, but for county council, that's, that's a sizable chunk. The other disappointment we have is our current exec, uh, Steve Hsu, he's a Republican, adamantly opposed to having this thing built. And we've met with him and had many Why conversations. Why is he so opposed? Hmm? Why is he opposed? Uh, opposed to building the SC Maglev. He doesn't want this thing disrupted. Why doesn't he want it? Why doesn't he want it? Because he doesn't want Anne Arundel County disrupted and the community's built, destroyed uh, to build this thing, okay? As well as the finance. He doesn't see how the hell the thing is going to get financed. How are they going to do it? The Democrats in favor of it. Here's the problem. We talked to Stuart Pittman, who won for our county executive, and he is neutral to leaning towards that we need to have more uh, transportation systems throughout Maryland. And also, he received a $2,000 campaign donation from Wayne Rogers. Now, again, he is a Democrat. Wayne, you know, is, is supporting Democrats. But the other one we did on campaign, if you get onto our, uh, any of the websites that and we've posted this, this information on uh, CAS, is that Michael Bush has received thousands of dollars in donations from everyone on the leadership team for BWR except for one person. So he's got ten thousand plus dollars for his campaign contribution. So, you know, not that they're buying influence, but they're clearly they're friends. They've known each other for a long time. Wayne and company have gotten a lot of influence in Annapolis. So, and that's I mean that's just kind of calling it like it is. This is what we're gonna have to fight. Right. So it's a mixed bag. 
<laughs> well, um, I, I wonder if I could just interject administratively here, uh, going back to, if we could, uh, we've touched part, partly on um, on four, on five, so I, that we, we'll go more into that. We, uh, more. But uh, can we give a summary of the Linthicum September 13th meeting that sure. Miss, Miss Renee Green video for, yes. videotaped for us? <laughs> but if you could start talking to the elected officials, those who attended that meeting would be a good idea because there were, there were, enough, there were several people there and that might be, yep. of, an, uh, that'd be of interest. We had all of the can Republican candidates for District 32 and District 1 for County Council. We had um, the incumbents, Pam and Mark Chang, and again, I pretty much gave you a, a kind of synopsis. All the Republican candidates were opposed to it, adamantly opposed to it. Um, Camp Bible Food is now Center, adamantly opposed to it, and actively working to try to stop it. Mark Chang opposed to it, actively working, trying to stop the FC Maglo from being built. And the others were neutral. And, and to the point of, and then coming back and saying that we, like with uh, Sarah Lacey, that we need to, the communities need to accommodate, you know, do, this thing if it's built. Okay. Uh, we also had representatives from Senator Sarbanes office who wrote his, who read a statement that he wrote. It is basically I, to give him not to defend him, but actually give you know his position right now, nothing has really come to either senator, whether it's Van Holland or Card to really look at. So they're being fairly neutral on this, you know. We want to wait and see what you know what come what comes to us, and then we'll make some determination. But we have reached out, Dennis and I and, and others have met with them and talked to them and kind of started talking to them about the challenges we see with going forward with building the SC Maglev, both to Maryland to, to our communities, to our counties, and to Maryland as a whole. And we just see lots of challenges here that should make one pause to say, is this thing really worth it to go try to get forward, okay? Uh, Especially since I understand they're funding Amtrak and they're funding uh, Maryland Rail. Correct. Well, one of the things, too, I was I can allude to, and again, some background. In the EIS, the Environmental Impact Study, and for those of you that may not be familiar with what an EIS is, it's not just looking at the environmental impact. It looks at finances. It looks at other you know, marketing. It, it's a broad, very broad look. And we have an expert here, actually, uh, on environmental impact study, uh, studies, uh, where they look at, how like you said, finance. And one of the things is looking at, is there a competing system, or is there an alternative system for people? Well, Amtrak, when we look at Amtrak, they've already gone through an EIS system, an EIS, and had it accepted by the Federal Railroad Administration, which is FRA. And they've already secured $2.7 billion loans to do major upgrades on the Northeast Corridor, and they have already completed major upgrades on their rail through Maryland. They've got continuous high-speed rail now all pretty much through Maryland, through the Northeast Corridor, through BWI down to DC. Um, the same track, one of the track systems that Mark uses, the pen line of the Mark system uses. Um, they're also securing and ordered higher, you know, more powerful engines locomotive or whatever to pull the these trains. And these are capable of going over 200 miles an hour. Mark trains, the reason Mark trains basically don't go all that fast, they get up to about 90 or so, is because the stops are very close to each other because it's a commuter line. You know, and the concept of a commuter is you try to make, you put stops in and make it as convenient as possible for people to get to and get on the train. Okay, then you put a relatively comfortable train in there, and then even though it takes 15, 20 minutes, so what? You got a nice comfortable ride, you're not driving, you know. And, and 90 miles an hour is a reasonable speed. Well, it's a safer speed. if we, if they run expresses, like they sometimes do between uh, Union Station and say Odington, or Union Station and the first time stop is Baltimore, they get well over 100 miles an hour. Right. Okay. So here's a little commuter train that's capable of going over 100 miles an hour. And guess what Mark has done? They've upgraded their cars three times, and they've just put a big order in for brand new engines that can go more even faster. Okay. So they're not standing still. So when you, by the time this thing gets built, you're looking at a train, okay, if it hits 300 miles an hour, that's great, but you're going to have Amtrak that's in the 200 mile range, and you have a commuter system that's capable of 100 miles an hour. May not necessarily run it all the time, because, again, 
the stations are rel relatively close to each other in all three lines to make it easier for people to get onto the so train. So do the powers but, that be know this information? Correct. And we're making sure they know this information. Because that's the biggest yeah. What we've got in the box. And Amtrak right now, there is no, there are no rail systems, passenger rail systems in the world that are paying for themselves. They're all being subsidized. Amtrak is getting pretty good though. They started in 1970, and President Nixon, okay, said this is a temporary funding issue, okay. Well, they're still funding it, okay. However. Amtrak's got the point now, they're covering over 90% of their operations costs with revenues. So their cost to the federal taxpayer of the state is relatively low for, for a system that big. Okay? We're looking at now a replacement that we don't see it being able to generate that kind of revenue stream, which means it's going to need a lot of subsidy. When we look at, for you, let's compare it to probably one of the worst in the country. Kevin, you might be able to actually answer this question if this is the worst or one of the worst in the country. It's the Maryland light, it's the Maryland um, light rail system. I think the last report we heard, it covered 18% of its operating expenses from the revenue, from its tickets. I don't know what it is. Okay. This is, he's oh. referring to Kevin, Kevin Radford. He's a, he uh, is a reporter for the Baltimore Sun yeah. and other papers, or say something, you report for the Baltimore yeah. Sun only, or? Oh, yeah. okay. So the last word we saw, they covered 18% of their operating expenses from their tickets. That means the rest of it is being subsidized by us mm. to keep that system running. Yeah. This runs to a big question. And that uh, is that we, name, I'm please. Gary Stone from up here Hills in South Florida. Thank you. Um, that uh, we're only getting drips and drabs of information about the project, and they only begin to go into a committed statements about it with the publication of the ALS report followed by the draft environmental impact statement. They moved the, uh, the ALS report, the alternatives report again. It's now marked on the website as being November. Uh, Next November? This November. This November. Okay. They, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. weeks. Uh, interesting. Well, you are here, and then there's November. Mm -hmm. they, moved, they moved it from September. To November. November, from October, excuse me, from October. Yeah. Well, they moved it from April to May to September to October, and, and now it's in November. When uh, Delegate Jerry uh, Valentino Smith was at the, the October meeting, who was that, mm -hmm. in South Laurel, and she had said that they had been told her that day mm -hmm. that it would be the end of December, beginning of January. That was standing with all well, the website. Well, but that, that wasn't was, from, you know, that wasn't, yeah. well, that's right. MTA. Yeah, MTA. It's an MTA's website for the project. Right. I'm, okay. but I'm just saying, the head of MTA had told her that day that it would be the end of November. Yeah. So that's an unreliable project. Okay. Okay. But our problem is that it's hard to make a concrete case against Jello that you know that is just PR. Right. Okay. Uh, and yet, what, what we're faced with is in November or December or January, there's going to be an alternative report. Right. And it may or may not be as complete as we would like it to be. That's one of the issues. But the other issue is that they have kept throughout this whole process says, oh, you can comment anytime. We're happy to get your comments. <coughs> well, it does no good if your comments come in after the main rush of comments and people start collating them and acting on them internally within the project. Excuse me for interrupting you. Please, in it, please say something more about what an al the alternatives report means. Well, the short please version I, is that uh, there's a number of milestone reports that are required under the EIS system, and this is uh, one of the, the last ones. When they'll be as more concrete than ever before about the, the actual geographic track and all the other things we hope that will be in there, but may not be. Uh, we have amassed uh, an understanding and some pretty pointed questions about this, and you've been communicating uh, with, with them. But I'm concerned that we make sure that all of those points and more get into the formal project record through the comments process no later than 30 days after the publication of this report, whenever that may be, so that they, someone can't point and say, oh, I wasn't in any comment. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll just not consider that. 
you know, we're not considered as, as heavily because. So I think we have some opportunities coming up. So we need to really a drive to let people know, get your comments. Well, I'm concerned by tax such and such. itself uh, translate what we have, right. okay, uh, into plain old fashioned comments for the, uh, at the MTA website. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, uh, and using that outline uh, to, to, to get the public to respond. You know, say, hey, we're making these comments. If you agree with us, please, please endorse. Uh, and, and not to mention, I, I'm not saying we haven't been doing anything, but what I'm saying is that I think there's a 30-day window coming and we don't know when it's going to open and it's going to slam shut pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So whoever is working, specifically working with the group of cats and, and the other uh, mm -hmm. liaising, liaising, <laughs> if that's the right word, uh, organizations need to be brought into, into that, into that well, they drive are, yeah. to, and they then, not so much of cats, but those organizations making the comments. Yeah, and I'm, that's the, that's the, yeah, yeah, the that's key, the, and that's individuals that's making those comments. That's the process. I'm just concerned that, 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 a, that a tipping point is coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, and after three days, I have no idea how responsive they'll be to comments. They, they, they will keep it open, but how, how, you know, how effective will it be? Mm -hmm. and, and I think until that report comes out, we can anticipate all the problems we've been discussing tonight. The failure to deal with this and that, and funding, and, and ridership, and all that. But until they come out with, it, with something in writing, mm -hmm. uh, we can only speak generically to the, to, to the concerns, and it right. sounds like I'm not sure what the word is, but it sounds like we're grousing about stuff with, that we don't have the fact. Well, it sounds like we're saying, oh, my neighborhood, and I don't want to lose my house, and that's how it would be taken yeah. as all these people no, are describing because they I don't want it. I want to point out, I'm concerned that we, that we have a, right. uh, a hard window. Well, but also, also remember that there are a lot of governmental and public institutions that are along the way that are following this and tracking this, and they've already weighed in negatively. The earlier the report earlier this year in large campaign. part because of your education campaign so that they would have, have a reason to respond to these uh, to, to these opportunities do you well we feel like um, uh, the protective service uh, mm -hmm. secret service weighed in very negatively mm -hmm. NSA weighed in very negatively but they're required because it's going mm -hmm. along or Going that bit. Uh, it's close or all service? through the property yeah. that they have. What was that? Is there something formal from Secret Service? Uh, the January PSA. The early, the early, the early report, report there were comments made comments, yeah. by, by several different organizations along the lines that were negative or not supportive of raised issues. So, we're, I mean, the public needs to stay tuned into what's going on. But it's not just impacting the public. There's other entities that are well, definitely tracking. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure that yeah. And things that we yeah, in terms of what we can touch. touch. Right. And when when you're writing comments, they need to not be from my from, from early on. I remember even last year, very specific comments about uh, about the various issues. Not just um, I see that the path is going to run through my house or my neighborhood. Right. Because that sounds like, oh, yeah, well, you know, you just don't want to lose your house. You know, it's yeah, not. But you don't want to not but, say that. But you want to say it, but not only, but saying it is, and I am concerned because it's right. da 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 da. It not can, just I'm angry because it's right through my house. It can have this kind of environmental impact in our community. Right. right. It, can, it will, right. the current right. alignment is going through right. a, a designated historical, you know, right. things you like know, that. National historic, you know. Building or and for those in Bladensburg, I would say, I mean, because it, it, it is, I mean, they're talking the waterfront park and that whole, the, where we had the rally mm -hmm. uh, in that area. That is, a, that we have historic property there. But we don't know where it's going to go yet. Well, but then we are, either way, that is part of the, the two proposed routes. They have two proposed routes and they are, they do affect the port At the draft level, level, we do know. At the draft level, it published. Yeah. What's, the first, what's the first route? What's the first okay. route? Coming out of Baltimore. Goes under the Patasca River, comes in, comes uh, under North Lithicum, through Lithicum, down to the airport, okay, underground. Leaves the airport underground, gets to the southern part of Anne Arundel County, comes above ground, all, the, all both routes, they, over top, they overlay each other, through mostly through Anne Arundel County. When it comes above ground, it's elevated, 
At that point is where the alternative routes are being discussed. One is on the east side of the parkway, one is on the west side of the parkway. Okay. And they wrap around, they go through Prince George's County, and not very long before they get into Washington, D.C., they go back underground. Through the Greenbelt? Belt? By yes. Greenbelt, just north of Greenbelt. Right. Now you go back underground, and one of the proposals is to have the station, the, the Washington station, under Metro Center. Okay, now I know they have, they, there's been some discussion on that. I don't know really? what the latest one is, but yeah. I think it's still Metro Center. What? Yeah, <laughs> I don't come in. At BWI, they're talking about coming in 150 oh, feet underground see. into BWI. Okay. The other, the again, it depends on which meeting you go to and which yeah. design you look at. Okay. Um, it's going to be somewhere between 80 and 150 feet underground when it gets to DC. And we're talking how many millions or billions? Well, they're estimating, was it 12 billion? They have they have been maintaining going back to the Public Service Commission hearings on the license. They have consistently said 10 to 12 billion dollars. Right. So 10 to 12 billion dollars for, we don't, we for a ride that would be 15 we, minutes quicker? Yeah, and we think it's probably going to be like <laughs> twice or more. Some Gary, of the estimates say, we've seen is as high as thirty-three billion dollars. Say, say your name, please, and say where where you live, just so, so everybody knows. Oh, I'm, I live in Lanham. My name is Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. There, there's no firm number. Uh, they have been saying up That's until probably about, low. Up until about six weeks ago, they were talking about submitting a ridership study and an economic analysis. And we understand that the ridership study was submitted about six weeks ago. Who was they ago. submitting it? The BWR, Baltimore, Washington, Rapid Rail. And at that time, uh, David Henley informed me that no, they are not in fact going to do an economic study. He's not the BWR. Right. Uh, he's the chair of BWR, mm -hmm. or he's the project manager. I'm sorry, not chair of BWR. He's the project man man manager for the, this project. And he said that will be all done as part of the EIS, yeah. that they're not going to submit anything that they've shown. So the total cost and, and everything, it's up in the air because... Nobody really knows. The published, uh, the published data that is available is at bwmaglev.info. Right. That includes maps of the right. two remaining possible routes. Okay. And BW maglev.info and at uh, uh, stopthistrain.org uh, too there are maps you can see and it gives the street the street numbers and everything else that they're looking at right now. Go ahead. I'm Brianna from Bowie. Um, when, when we, um, when you just said that they've been consistently saying with 10 to 12 billion, billion but that was at the beginning when a lot of it was still above ground and then wow. after the, the last Switch up, and now they send it underground. <coughs> that was that was pointed out to them. Yes. Okay. Well, and a that, note that, that was pointed out to them, and they said early on there was seventy percent above ground, thirty percent underground, mm -hmm. and they were talking ten to twelve billion dollars. So when it changed to be seventy-five percent underground, we questioned the numbers, and their response was, "Well, the ten to twelve was based upon an assumption that it'd be a fifty-fifty split above ground, below ground. So it'll change mm -hmm. a little bit, but not." So, I mean, they've been deflecting whenever you ask them questions. So, one of the red flags that comes up immediately is for all those communities where they're saying, oh, we're not going to disrupt your community because we're going to tunnel under you. Uh -huh. Right? Oh. Well, we, yeah. can see, we can see <laughs> them getting into this. They come out of Baltimore. Well, they have to tunnel to come out of Baltimore. They have to tunnel to go into D.C. Just we don't see a way they're going to be able to do this above ground right there. Okay. But by the time they come out of Baltimore, and into the northern part of Anne Arundel County, you know, we see this is a the potential. They're going, wow, you know, this is really costing us a whole lot more than we thought where it was, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to come above ground soon. Mm -hmm. And apropos that's when that, they start blasting through communities. And that's apropos to that, there was a meeting at the yeah. uh, Greenbelt. They were hanging around Greenbelt a lot, and they were at the New Deal, et cetera. And I was at one of the meetings, just four or five people, and David Henley was talking, project manager, BWRR was talking about the uh, 
uh, um, about uh, over and under. And I think earlier on that they, because in our, this area, in Port Towns, they had talked about over for most, and then, then they switched it to being under. Well, they were talking about the financing and just going through, this is what we do, this is what we do, and then this is approved, blah, blah, blah. Then we go to for financing. And then he said, then we present this, and then we have to, you know, go to negotiate the financing, et cetera. And he had been talking about the costs, okay? And then I said, and, and I said, uh, oh, um, which is cheaper? Which is less expensive? And he, underground or overground, because we're switching, you're saying under, because they were talking, they had switched to saying under. Okay. And then he said, well, overground, definitely. Well, I said, so if they come back and say to you, we can finance for this, We'll, then you can, you'll switch it up maybe and go over. Right. And he said, well, and he kind of shrugged. Well, they keep saying that this is all going to be privately funded and they've got investors, et cetera. In a couple of meetings that we were at, they made a comment, well, we're, we will, we're looking at a private, you know, uh, public partnership and we'll probably go to the federal government and ask for money. Well, let's, okay. So if they're really thinking that way, and the federal government comes back and says, you know, we really can't cough up, you know, $10 billion, but we could cough up five. Mm. How much tunnel did that just eliminate? Mm. And then the gambler's fall fallacy kicks in. Right. You've got to protect that five with the future. Uh, right. They, the they, future. they have secured $5 billion financing from Bank of Japan. Mm. And Why is Japan so interested in it's where the technology is coming from? They're just selling your tech. One is yeah, where the, the, the train is a Japanese. But so what? What one they is one, one, <laughs> one is this is the technology. It's Japanese. There were two Japanese and German. German basically went away. So they have the Japanese technology. And Abe Shinto had said he wants this. The same thing with the Germans when they were trying to push this. They want this as a product that they can export from Japan to throughout the world. So really what Wayne Rogers is trying to do is create a marketplace for Japanese technology in the United States. But so they can now, just go now, everywhere they go. Now, going back, they have secured a low interest, long term loan, according to what David Henley said, from the Bank of Japan. And both he and Wayne Rogers at different meetings have referenced the fact that the, the federal government has a 20, 35, I think it's 35 billion dollar pot of money available for infrastructure upgrades of railroad systems. And they think they are entitled to some, if not all of what they need to finish this project from that fund. Well, that might not be true, but that's what they're eyeing. And Wayne Rogers has been very, I think in one or two of the committee hearings in Annapolis, he referenced that as where they're going to get the rest of the money. Can I make sure. Say your name, please. I'm Joan. I'm from Woody. Um, and I've been working with these guys you know, from the beginning, looking at all of these things. And, um, could, could, you, could you maybe stand and <laughs> over there and talk? Not, not. <laughs> <laughs> um, just two issues on um, these guys have talked about the amount of money, um, but this thing runs. What they're studying is from D.C. to Baltimore. Wayne Rogers, the um, from BWRR has said repeatedly, well, our plan is to go to New York. But they're not studying this to New York. They're only studying from D.C. to Baltimore. They're only talking about the money that it's going to take from D.C. to Baltimore. Um, if they get to Baltimore and this thing doesn't function, doesn't make money, then we get a railroad that goes from D.C. to Baltimore. And that's it. doesn't work. If it goes to Baltimore. Well, um, but, but, make just real quickly, sorry. under the, this environmental impact statement that these guys have been talking about, um, is being done under the National Environmental Policy Act. That law requires that a project have what they call independent utility, meaning it has to function from D.C. to Baltimore. It has to be economically viable. If they only ever build that, they never built another stretch of it, it's going to function. We're really interested in what we haven't seen. Is that riders, how are they going to get enough riders from D.C. to Baltimore? To That's another issue. So um, one of my big problems with this is with this section through Prince George's County. Um, there's another exec, uh, executive order um, called um, environmental justice. And environmental justice uh, is built around um, that the idea that projects, federal projects, should not have disproportionate impacts on low-income and minority populations. 
Really? The only part of this project that's above ground goes through Prince George's County. Mm -hmm. Goes through major green space in Prince George's County. If it goes along the parkway, I mean, right now you yes. drive, yes, the parkway can be a parking lot, but it is green space on either side. This is going to tear it out. Those impacts are only hitting in Prince George's County. Mm -hmm. They're not hitting anywhere else. Mm -hmm. David Henley, and you can just, if you can go to the Facebook page for, for CATS, um, there's a video of this, so if you don't have to take my word for it, you can watch David Henley say this. But we were here in Bladensburg. How long ago was that? February this February. year. It feels like a year ago. February. Good. And, really right and someone at that meeting asked David Henley, um, how much is a ticket going to cost? Mm -hmm. That was their question. He didn't answer that question. It was the simple question. No, actually, he got himself in trouble. Because he could have said the cost of an Amtrak ticket. Mm -hmm. We think it's going to be the same. That's what he's told us before about the same as, uh, as an Excel Amtrak uh, ticket. But instead he said, well, this train's not for everyone. Mm-hmm. Sure. Oh, okay. I remember. I remember. Like I said, this is something you watch him on video saying. He was a little more, he was a little more explicit. Well, first he just said, this train's not for everyone. Then he said, there's a pent-up demand for high-end riders mm -hmm. who want to, to get from D.C., you know, from these cities to see. <laughs> but he, and then he went on to say, But he specifically people. said, mm -hmm. He then went on to say, you know, people from Colmar Manor might not ride this train. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so that means Bloomberg. Very simple. Very simple. I'm sorry. I thought you, you said two he points. He said it because he, he, he came back to it after he started with this train's not for everyone. He wrapped it up by saying, you know, people from Comar Manor might not ride this train. Right. But so this train that, is not for us. He said that after one of the other folks he was with from BWRR, or was it one of the elected officials? I think it was the mayor. I think that's it. The mayor the mayor I think that's it. The mayor pulled him to the oh. side and said something, but it was... Well, yeah. you know, after the former mayor, she came back to know everyone will be able to ride it. Yeah. So yeah, everybody will be able to ride it if you can afford it. Um, but it's going to disrupt our communities and our green space, and you know our voices are small, and it's it's difficult to get out. You know, that, and that's that why we all have to really bend together, get the bodies out there, get the people out there at the rallies, and and I'll maybe just a segue, for example, to the October 6 rally we have here in Lanesburg, and this is what I want to bring up. It was a it was a really good rally. It was a good cross section of people along the route. However, and it was noticed, but the bodies and the people and the advertisement were partly because people didn't know, because as enough has not been in the papers, not enough has been said. People, people didn't did know, know we didn't get we didn't get a lot of people that was noticeable that way. We, it was noticeable and it was in this in a certain sense. However, my concern was uh, that without getting people out and i think this is one of the green belt advocates we have all the people along the line and we have people in Bowie and et cetera too and there's the concern we need to bring the, the force of the people into it because it directly is affecting yes the proposed routes and that's where we have to really band together and get people out <coughs> and get people active but if we can too bring in the Bowie people still and the Gennard people and whoever else to come in and shore it up and say we along the line and in this county and in in uh, in uh, Anne Arundel and no we do not want this and show the bodies because a lot of times I mean and I'm not saying it in a, in a negative way to report it but a lot of times and I appreciate Kevin is here because it's a small meeting a lot of times we don't don't come out unless it's a big thing to do you know and it, and that's why I appreciated him coming out to our rally and talking to people and taking the time instead of just shrugging his shoulders and say, oh, well, it's a small group of people. But a lot of times you've got to make noise, and that's the fact. Yeah. You've got to make noise. I was going to say, in the Lithica, the Lithica meeting, where right. on the negative side, not, we should have been able to fill the auditorium, and we did. Okay, because we had all those representatives there, we had the candidates there. I mean, they could have seen clearly mm -hmm. that there's a lot of resistance to this. But, However, but, but you scheduled it Thursday night for, on a Ravens game. Yeah, I did. Well, what they said, but uh, that's, that's just the way it fell. Right. Okay, our meeting. However, the good news was we had representatives, we had presidents and vice presidents from the community associations right. all along in Roman County. Mm -hmm. They were there rep mm -hmm. represented. So and many of them spoke up and said, "Hey, we're here. I'm here from Bodington. We don't want this thing. I'm here from 
uh, harm is. Well, we don't want this thing. I'm here from North Lynn, but we don't want this thing. We see it, you know, doing a lot of damage and a lot having a, a major negative impact on our communities. Can I should say one more thing on the environmental justice part? On the in Anne Arundel County, go ahead. in Anne Arundel County, the um, where it would come above ground if it is on the west side would actually go through Maryland City, which is also a low income, a lot of elderly oh, right. um, folks in that area. Yeah. Um, so even in Anne Arundel County, it's hitting the lower yep. income area is yep. where they're. they're well, one thing I appreciated that Kevin captured uh, from ours was the the voice of one of my neighbors, actually a Hispanic neighbor across the street, who came to the rally. They were there all day, with kids and everything else, and it was very important saying there's not enough. There's not. They're not reaching out in Spanish to explain, especially in this area. You know, reaching out, explaining it. And I know David Henley. I'd asked him several times. We'd asked him before. Do you have anybody who can speak Spanish? who can explain it, have a meeting that, of Spanish speakers and explain what this is all about. And they're like, um, well, um, well, but this is part of the people you're affecting. Has so it, it says to me they're not that interested. Has they, it been on know. local news? Uh, maybe local, local, news. local news. The Green Bell, one of the biggest television, but not you know, TV. No, but, you know, but as far as, as newspaper and news coverage, Green Belt Review has been really the one hot on giving series about, you know, long, they had several a series of, of, of the background, et cetera. And there's, I see a lot in the Green Belt Review. There's been a number of articles in the Maryland and Catholic Gazette. The Sun Papers have done a pretty, pretty oh, good job oh, yeah. to try to pick up key articles along the way. Yeah, key. There have been, there have been the some. You know, but it should be on TV. It's yeah. not consistent enough, and I think well, I think by design, I'm not going to be a good story, but it's partly by design, but because, because it happens a lot with things like this. I think right. that they, they don't go out and really try to hit the groups. Well, there's, there's, there's been a bit of a lull because yeah. they've yeah, been working true. on their study and doing the design work. Like that. But there even was before. A, there was a lot of, what, but there was a, yeah. uh, both in the print and on TV, there were, news articles during the legislative session because there were five, seven bills that were being considered. Right. And they got reported on, but since the legislative session has been kind of a wall yeah. as well. Well, yeah. if, if, if uh, this report drops in December, I think we should ask for a 60-day extension. So it's a holiday. Yeah. You say it again. Should we didn't you say holiday. Yeah. I said if, if they bring out their report in the middle of the holiday season, right. yeah. I think we should ask for more time to respond. Right. They've done it before. They've done it before and they'll do it again. How? There was one other, one other piece of, go ahead, you go. No, John, from your experience, since you are knowledgeable in the NEPA process, if there is a request to extend the time, do you usually grant it or not? Generally, yes, um, just for good PR. Right. Um, the alternatives report is not a required document, and it is not a required uh, oh, okay. comment period. Okay. Um, the draft EIS, draft EIS is okay. legally they must have a 45 day comment right. period and we would I would think we should request almost 120 right. days. It's gonna be a massive doc. It's gonna be I, I've made, I've to made a few deal. requests. <laughs> 45 days is impossible. I've actually made a few requests that they put all the documents that they finalize, not work in progress, but finalized documents. Put it on their website. Yeah. And they have they have to do it. I mean that would yeah. like government does, right? I mean they have their, their you know, all these reports <laughs> probably end up as appendices in the EIS draft EIS. And this is a government like report. report. It's, a, it's yeah. the FDA website. Yeah. FDA, right. It's the FDA. Right. Right. So they ought to be more responsive than you They ought to be, but they're not. So. Well, one thing about this area, kind of to wrap up about the, our rally, is this. My neighbor that I mentioned, and she was cited, and she uh, uh, appreciated being mentioned and making her statement about it, because it's very, it's very true. Uh, so many people, but aside from even Spanish speakers, the people in this area, when I was going around talking to people about the rally and, and she was going around, she said that she was up at the, at the school after school and had flyers about the rally. And she was talking to Spanish and, and otherwise speakers. And almost everyone said, mothers picking up kids, they said, oh, the purple line. Oh, you mean the, mm. and then the comment, she said, no, it's something else. And they were like, what, you know? And I think there's an attitude that, quote, poor people like us and foreign language, you know, people speaking the different languages or whatever, not just even Spanish, but they don't really count that much. It's what it is a bit, the justice, the justice issue. Is this fair? 
does it matter? Oh, so you lose houses of the people low, of lower income or modest income. Oh, well. Within Anne Arundel County, the yeah. confusion is between the hyperloop and the ESC medical. Yeah. 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 Yes. So I can't tell you how many articles are posted, you know, to all of our Facebook pages, to our next door, well, let's come side or whatever, say, no, they're two different things. Right. SC Maglev, you know, it's got a lot more traction, a lot more money. This is, you know, this is, yeah. got to take this seriously. Hyperloop right now, we really don't know that much about. And, you know, it's, Elon Musk is like trying to throw money around to do something, but he may not. And who knows? So we really don't have much information on that. Is we're not, we're kind of keeping an eye on it, but it's the SC Maglev. It's just going to take the hyperloop from, uh, Washington DC to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so and now let me bring back to the agenda so we can work through is it sure. uh, we're still talking more about these things though. Other community meetings and events, is there anything else that you Nothing. can announce that's been arranged as yet? Yeah. Yeah. As, as I said, it's been a bit of a lull. We we are anticipating that once this alternative report comes out, that'll be form a basis for in uh, a resurgence in activity, if you will. So that's, that's kind of like why we postponed last month's meeting and why we're not going to have a December meeting. Right. But we're going to look at January because we expect the alternative report to be on the table to be discussed at that point. Well, exactly my, with the elections, you know, that's where the focus and the interest was. Sure. So it's. Well, and my thought with this one is a kind of a good wrap up, you right. know, before it really started to get hot and heavy with it uh, because we had other things. Yeah. But yeah. And, and also, January meeting would be. Will be uh, January 10th, which is right the, right before the start of the next legislative session. So that'll be another reason to give us a well, you know, hopefully an alternative report and we'll have plans for what to do. When, what is the <coughs> January 10th? We are. Oh, we haven't gone on site yet. We haven't done a site yet. Be, We've been and, moving thing, around and that's one thing that about the about the 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 um, uh, the this liaison structure too is. I decided, I, I said I would go ahead and host one here and we thought it was a good idea I went to another meeting and it'll be in another place. So we're trying to catch people along the line. And to me, it's it's great. We have people who are not, they're just not on not Bladesburg or Goma Manor or whatever. They're from other areas too, because the more I found out much more about what was going on and got hooked up with this cast of characters <laughs> because I went to meetings in Greenbelt. And I said, well, let me find out more. I heard about it from some meeting that Senator Benson had and then I found out more about it um, because I went to Greenbelt meeting and I went to, I, don't, I didn't get to the Bowie meeting because I didn't know that was before I heard about it from Senator Benson at another meeting she had. And then I said, wait a minute, and every time I saw oh, Greenbelt, I would go to Greenbelt and go to that meeting. And I kept saying, wait a minute, oh, this and that, and trying to then get people in this area, in Port Towns, interested. And, send, and get them you know, geared up and say, wait a minute, this is something we're talking about and this is something important. And then I found by that, I too, some people in Woodlawn, people in um, um, Beacon Heights, the, who, who, I, who I also saw there at, at other meetings. And all of these little points of light trying to right. bring things around and, uh, and to do it. And also, let's go to then the next thing would be, the sub, we started to touch on the, the, the media reporting. We've already said, uh, have you, has it, let me have a question. Have, have you read things in the paper about have you been reading have you seen anything about Maglev particularly? I've spent all my time on the website going through everything on the right. website. But as far as like the you know, like seeing in the paper, the local, have you seen anything? I think I have seen something where they, it was very brief but they said there was opposition. Mm -hmm. And that's why I read the article. Right? Yeah. It was very brief but it did talk about there's opposition and gave some opinions and they talked with people. So there's, I mean, I think one of the most substantive I've seen really is Kevin's, is Kevin's piece where he's really laying it out. And aside from the Greenbelt Review, which I mentioned, they've been on that subject for a while, but, you know, laying out uh, the, to me, the pragmatic parts of it that I haven't seen as much in some other articles. Not just talking about it, but really getting at who did this and when and how and, and what. And I think that would, in, in, in a, in a, uh, um, an in-depth but a readable style, so it could keep your attention to keep reading it instead of just say, oh, blah, 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 the train, blah, 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 and it goes on the track and does this, you know. And um, it, uh, I think that's what's important. We want to see more reporting like that that really reaches to people, look, what does this mean, you know. Like, just was, there was just to explain what Dan was explaining, you know, laying it out like, oh, I mean, that in itself, it's like, da, 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 and this is why, that would, that is, Good. I mean, that's exactly what it encompasses 
all the different things as it spools out, as you said. And that kind of media, that kind of that kind of reporting, I think, is something that's well, really this explanation was really important. Yeah. And you see that ten to twelve billion, you know, that's ridiculously low. When you start talking about uh, the ventilation every three miles or so, it's, it's obviously going to go higher than that. Then you start thinking about safety and fences and things people. like that. It's going to go off the charts, and you know we're going to finance it. Uh, what's your name and where are you? Gina from? Smith. I'm from Bladensburg. Great. Right. You know, but laying it out in that detail, like I said, it's just impossible for it to be that low. And, and they, they know it. it. And they know. And they talked about. Actually, I don't know if it's still on the. They said, "Oh no, we're not worried about it." Right. They talked about the Waterfront Park event station. See, that's a disrupting our environment. It was mentioned in one event, one of the ventilation stations you were talking about. They said in one of those in the one of the letters. Oh, the letter from Park and Planning. Mm -hmm. uh, right. and they said it, they they objected to being at the Waterfront Park. So apparently they read a report right. that said something about having a vent station. They probably right. came another mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wondered in that there was a question that came up in their letter. Uh, when, who was it who questioned? Maybe it was Bill. They they, they mentioned something about a um, about a report, something about a report date. And the question I think it was maybe Bill was asking: Have they seen a report we haven't seen? Because in their letter they mention um, uh, in the report they referred to a report dated draft alternatives report dated august 2018. that's the one we're waiting to see right, the, we're saying in november one. they apparently saw a draft but that's what right. the question that bill had brought up so they must have seen the draft of what the, they're going the to agencies, yes they see the draft before it's made public but one of the things is in this area it states about the deep tunnel alignments um and it said um this is what they, 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 they're not really against, but they, in, uh, park and planning, but they said they had a lot of questions about it. So they didn't say they were against it. Okay, they said here, two the two proposed alignments travel through and the proposed vent facilities are located in two communities identified by Prince George's County's Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative as facing significant economic health, public safety, and educational challenges. Notably, Woodlawn slash West Lanham Hills and East Riverdale slash Bladensburg. The area of Bladensburg designated for a potential vent facility features the Bladensburg Waterfront Park and residential neighborhoods surrounded by a concentration of the region's heavy and light industrial and utility facilities. We are not in favor of this location because of the potential impacts to the fragile ecosystem of the Anacostia River, new trails that connected to the district, and the recreational activities that occur in our plan in the area. The proposed impacts to the residents in the area bear a disproportionate share of the region's industrial traffic and other locally unwanted land uses and their sensitivity to and ability to withstand environmental impacts should be considered. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Say your name. And um, I'm Jessica. I'm from Mount Rainier, Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, so, park and planning has an issue with this. I'll, and I'm saying this from a reference that I work for Bladesburg Waterfront Park, but yes. I also work okay. for the United States National Arboretum. How do they play into this? Because I, based on what the National Arboretum is, it is a research-based facility that holds germplasm for ornamental um, plants, and I feel like, I mean, they're right across the river from each other. So I would see, I would think that somehow USDA should be a part of this because that would affect our, that entire facility as well. It's not far from each other. Well, that, not only those two sites, but you also have the uh, park, the Belter and Cultural Research Center. Yeah. And actually 300 acres of that site is where they're looking at their their uh, oh. maintenance facility, their yard, rolling stock oh. yard. And the Kenilworth and Aquatic, maybe. Sorry, what? And the Kenilworth Aquatic. Right. Mm -hmm. And then Langston Hughes Golf Course, which is historical as well, mm -hmm. because that's at the end mm -hmm. of the so, arena. But, the, but the, those agencies are okay. playing in mm -hmm. on that for, for various reasons. So, like I mean, I'm just asking more so because, you know, as working these places, I mean, right. I still have heard nothing about this. And, you know, once I learned about this, you know, going on, I mean, there's numerous things 
wrong. I mean, and especially because both of those facilities right. have to deal with outdoors. I mean, just Blainsburg Waterfront Park in general has the wetlands. Yes. I mean, that, that might alone. That be a very good question to take back. Okay. And say, you know, hey, yeah. I went to these meetings and hearing about this. What all do you know about it? Yeah. And spread, you know, especially from the Blainsburg meeting earlier this year, mm -hmm. the impression I get from BWR is that they feel that once they go underground, you're not going to notice it, you're not going to feel it, it's not going to impact you. So, and it was kind of interesting because when someone, they were asked about what would happen if they do the vibrations and all, they said they would agree to instrument your house to see if it's, you know, due to their trains, mm -hmm. but they didn't obligate themselves or commit to doing any kind of remediation. Well, I asked, what happened, I asked so. at, uh, at a meeting, I asked them, I don't know if it was David Hanley or someone else at one of the meetings, and I think a couple there have been different. Uh, when they, oh, it was not a meeting, it was one of the open houses where they had all the maps out and they showed everything. And they said, uh, somebody was standing there asking, we then we, we were asking about, oh, it's right under, they said, right, it's right under here. And she said, well, what, what if it affects my foundation and does whatever, cracks? And they said, oh, well, well, no, it's saying 90 feet, whatever, it won't affect anything. Uh, but, but if it does, will be responsible for repairing it but be sure you have before and after pictures oh now i saw a news report not long ago about um, metro and i know this claim that's not as deep but it was an elder lady and she was her china cabinet and things were shaken off the cabinet and she said well i've been in touch with metro they're not calling me and then they, she was showing the cracks in her wall and again they're not calling you so they do all that you know, but once they get started, you know, you're not necessarily going to hear from them. You know, now my name, my community was built in 1947. Mm -hmm. I had some work done in my front yard. They had like a bobcat, and it broke one of the pipes under How me. Many are you talking about? Okay, I mean that it's it's old. The community is old. Okay. The pipes are old. The homes are old. Of course, it's going to have an effect. You know, and they can't exactly measure it, but you can't exactly. Then you don't need to build it. They need contingency funding for that scenario right. or any other risk identified risk. Right. So they, they can't just say, we'll do whatever the judge orders us mm -hmm. to do. And then you have to fight that. I had a cousin who um, lived on, uh, before they did that 410 stretch, um, she lived on Ardmore, Ardwick, and you know, they say they're going to give you the value, the market mm -hmm. value of they your home. Say, they had to take them to court because they weren't given the value. They had to a judge make them give the value Again, of their home. What's so. the market value of a home that's scheduled to be destroyed? Right. Mm -hmm. And then if yeah. you're going to leave that space, you have to be able to buy another home. Right. I'm like you. Yeah. I retired. I paid my house mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. I had some work done on my I had some solar panels put on my house. You know, so all is that going to be included in the value? Of course not. You know. One of the things that got attracted a lot of people to get interested in this in Lithica. Lithica is a community that was originally founded in 1659 with a land grant. Okay, it was uh, two families, Elizabeth and Shipley. Uh, they started, they started farms. Okay. Quick history: before World War II, some houses came with a train lines finally came into existence, going from uh, Baltimore to Annapolis and down to DC. The train. Uh, there were stations put up and allowed people to leave Baltimore prior to air conditioning where it's always hot, it would be really hot in the summer to come out into the counties. It's a lot more open, more breeze, it's cooler, so lawyers, doctors, etc. moved out into the community. Uh, and kind of the start of where it World War II was like all their Levitt towns. It grew up, the decision was to build BW, uh, BWI, which was at that time Friendship Airport. Westinghouse moved out there, Defense Center, government facilities moved out there. A lot of business, uh, key business moved out to that area. And so engineers and scientists and stuff came out to the area. That's kind of where it came from. But we have descendants of the Lithicum Chipley family still living there. Oh. We have family that have five and six generations that are living, not just one or two, many. We have extended families, second and third cousins, moving back into the area. And the reason for that is because it's been a very stable, quiet, kind of off-the-radar community. And what people have done, they've bought these homes, 
and they've invested a lot of money into these homes, far more than their market value, because they're playing. I am one of them. My plan was, when I move out of that house, it's because I'm going to get a little spot that I'm going to be laying in, okay? That's the, that's the next move, okay? So, I, I'm not the only neighbor. We've way overbuilt and invested in our house to get any type of fair, quote unquote, fair market value out of it. And we're not the only ones. When you go, the other one we, we ran into very early on, where we were looking at one of the alignments, is if you have an elderly couple who, like many elderly couples, have invested heavily in their home, because that's going to be part of their retirement, this is where they're going to live, okay? And then they do a reverse mortgage, so they have the finances. And now you take their home mm -hmm. through, you know, eminent domain, mm -hmm. they could end up with nothing by the time they pay off that. I've got neighbors whose homes are already underwater. So. Yeah, so, because the banks are not going to, the lending institutions and stuff are not going to take a bath on this. Okay? We will. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention too is, and it, you know, all these different ta facets to this thing. In looking at why would they want to build the Baltimore to DC piece first? And what we're thinking is that in many ways this might be the easier piece to build. Okay. And easier in that it's not that far to get it in place and they have this, they have a, a Washington ba base and they have a major city like Baltimore on the other end. They go back and say, well, you know, we really can't make a go of it unless we get to New York. Mm. They get the okay to go to New York. They're going to take a lot. They're going to take a roller and go straight in anything from Baltimore to New York that isn't a major obstacle. They're going to buy. They're going to take it by a minute, don't they? And, it, and it's probably going to be a bunker. Mm -hmm. and that's our that's our s speculation, and I think it's got some fairly good reasoning with it. Okay. It's a pretty densely populated state. Yeah, yeah Pennsylvania's already said one. Connecticut's already come out and said they don't want this thing. We're, I think Rhode Island goes and said they don't, we don't want this thing. Did you want to say something? I was just going to ask because we're probably running tight on time. If there's any other major updates. I think we pretty much hit on everything we talked about the EIS. Community organizations, civic organizations, et cetera, are informed. Dennis and I and Bill have been going out and meet with them, explain to them, and we're getting them to come out in opposition. Odington. And largest community here. association in, in, Mar in Anne Arundel County, 10,000 members came out and said, we're opposed. Absolutely opposed to 10, this 10,000? 10,000 members, okay. By biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest one in Anne Arundel County, if not one of the biggest in the state. But they then put pressure on Maryland General Assembly. Right. And you get a number of them now, especially on the finance part of this, that I it's going to, what was it, the mayor, you were talking to the uh, mayor of Ocean City, and he said, wait a minute, they take money from, uh, we got to, we got to, yeah, former, we got to rebuild roads, you know, going in Ocean all the time, because the world, we could have been, I'm against this stuff. Why okay. is the Black Legislative but, Caucus against it, or for it? They jobs. have come out in support jobs. just because well, of the job okay. there's, so, there's some question that they have. Oh, okay. Because that's all I read. They said well, the legislative caucus. At said. the on November second, they had their little uh, announcement that mm -hmm. BWR had signed a, a, and Northeast Maglev had signed an agreement with the trades union headquartered in Baltimore, and they were at the BMO BMO uh, museum up there, and. Most of the delegation representing Baltimore City were up there, and the, she, I don't believe she's the head of the caucus, but she spoke as though the caucus was supportive, and that created some issues and problems because she was not representing what, my understanding, oh. she was not representing what the caucus actually took a position. The, the, the uh, delegation that represents Baltimore is in favor of it because they see this as an economic boon to Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. They see how it as a boon. How does it from, what gets you from, New, from D.C. to Baltimore? And in 15 minutes. Yeah. The terminals. The no, when it goes to New York, you're going to be going from D.C. to New York and you're going to be blowing straight through Baltimore and you're not going to be getting off the train and you're not going to be... Maryland is flat by country. But they don't feel... But any... It's a march train right now. 
true, but, but, but any terminal, any terminal <laughs> along the line, whether it's a metro, whether it's Amtrak, whether it's this, any terminal will see an economic stimulus as a result of that. To some degree. But I'm sorry, we're having to wrap up, guys, because right. they close. I'm just saying, yeah. where the terminals are located, right. there right. will be an impact, and they're probably positive for for economics. In between, where it runs, it's neutral or, or negative. Fly by. Yeah. So and in so the in between, Prince George's County is now a fly by county. Right. right. Fly by as is for remote for Anne County. So, how much money are we putting in the tax wise? What percentage of this funding of this 12 mil bill, whatever it is? I thought it was it was already funded by private investors no, in Japan. No. No. How much are we putting in? Well, they'll no. say it's loans, but it's no. not. Loans. And if I understand, it, Japan has basically, it, they don't actually have the loan in hand with the money. What they have is a promissory note that if this right. gets built, this it gets, gets approved, bigger. they start building it. Japan will make available five billion dollars. Five billion dollars, right? Uh, okay, so it's a promissory note. It's like a matching. And then, if you listen to them, they and started, they, and then we have to finish it. If you listen to their public comments, they say because they're pushed back to my use of the term subsidies. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to them, they'll say all of the operating maintenance costs will be covered by the fees charged for ridership. Uh -huh. Now, to me, I don't know of any other. Operation and maintenance to me is 100 percent of the cost. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But Wayne Rogers was quoted in a, I think, a Washington uh, Business Journal article. He was saying, "Hey, listen, no project like this can be done totally on private money. It's got to be a public-private private partnership. partnership, which means he's going to be taking dollars, tax dollars." Well, when did they nail that premise to the to the door? I mean, they've been well, talking about this well, we for two push, years. We see the EIS to see what is in there. Is that there's is is two of their big financial. Look, there's, they're saying, one, Washington is so expensive retail space and office space that if we we can provide a rapid transit system between Baltimore and Washington D.C., offices can put their back office operations up in Baltimore, where it's a heck of a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. And if you need to get to Washington, D.C., well, you hop on the train, you're there in 15 minutes. Well, no, you're not. That's just, okay. and that's just that's for there's two. There's two things. One, you got to get there, you got to park, you got to wait for the train to show up, you get that's, on, like any train, then you get off, you get parked, you know, get to the place. So it's not 15 minutes. Secondly, <laughs> while the office space cost in Baltimore is a lot cheaper than Washington, D.C., there's no question about it. Every time you want to do that, you're going to heck, hand somebody $50 bill. No, Every it's going to be time. more than 50 bucks. Right, or are you going to ride Mark? Well, if you're going to ride Mark, because it's only 10 bucks, why aren't you doing it already? Right. You know, so that that argument. The other argument they offer about all these jobs. When we were at the rally in Annapolis, I went up and I was talking to a couple IDW. They came in town to protest, guys. Mm -hmm. And I walked up and said, okay, brother, you, you were here. I was, I was a union member. Here's, you know, here are my, you know, my credits. Here's where I, who I belong to. You know. Great. You're going to get jobs and all this training for three, maybe five years. And then what? And then it's done. It goes to the maintenance. Millions of dollars that would have gone into transportation and infrastructure projects is now going to basically run this hole in the ground. But That's all those jobs that you will have for general. They're gone for generations. And isn't there a question about the man hours? They say yes. man hours isn't happens. another isn't a job. I don't it's just hours work. of work. Yeah. Let, let me let me just throw something. Just this yeah. is a criticism we got back. A little bit of pushback from Steny because I threw out this issue about the seventy-four thousand jobs that they're talking about today versus during the PSC hearing they were talking about seventy-four thousand job years. Mm -hmm. Which, if it's a 10-year construction project, that's only 7,400 jobs. And then he made a good point. He said, especially for the trade unions and what have you, and then good luck. Yeah. Construction jobs, they aren't a lifetime job. No, they never are. Because they go from one project to the next project to the next project. So if, even if they created 5,400 jobs, they're creating 5,400 jobs. But the counter to what Steny was telling me is, the head of the union was interviewed 
And he said, you know, is, is Bank Lab, yeah, we've got this partnership, it's going to be great, we're going to get all these jobs. In the closing paragraph of this article, he was quoted as saying, but you know, if Mad Lab doesn't happen, the Amtrak work will come along and we're going to have jobs anyway. Oh, wow. wow. And then she Jobs. <laughs> You're going to have that. You're going to have the bridges that are be able to be built sooner, the roads, etc. All of them require electricians, concrete workers, structural steel, all of these. What what needs to be done is is the projects that are funded and advanced are, should be those that will solve the congestion area or address the congestion problems in this region.